That was beautiful, wasn't it? Wow, that was a treat. That was great job. Great job. Well, welcome everybody today. Go ahead and stand to your feet as we begin worshiping together. Say to harm that 
right, good morning. Good morning, everybody. Good to see everybody today. Good morning. Let's go ahead and make our way back to our seats. Welcome, everybody. Welcome, everybody that's here in the service. And also, boy, this is really shrill. Maybe I'll pull this back a little bit. Amen. Amen. I think that's the first hallelujah I ever heard in this church. Come on now. <laughs> hallelujah. All right. Anyways, welcome everybody here. Welcome everybody that's watching online. Thanks to Andrew. We're streaming on Facebook and YouTube. So, isn't that awesome? Welcome our online viewers. That is so wonderful, so wonderful. And if you're visiting here today, we sure hope that you uh, just sense the joy of the Lord and the love of God. And there's a visitor card on, the, um, on your bulletin here. And would you please fill this out? And uh, if you can get it done in time, drop it in the offering plate or uh, hand it to me at the end of the service or one of the greeters. And uh, we just want to, just so glad that you're here. And by the way, uh, when, I, when I say offering plate visitors, you don't have to pay to come to church here. And so, so feel free. You know, the offering we have, we, we believe in practicing tithes and offerings, but we're not going to hound you for money, are we, church? This is a blessed church, and so we just want you to enjoy the service and just hope that you get a touch from God today. Um, actually, as far as the announcements, I think, every, I think you can read pretty well, right? You can read pretty well. And so just see the bulletin and uh, from all the different things that are going on um, throughout Christmas. It's hard to believe Christmas is already here. Actually, Thanksgiving. I can't forget about Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. That's right. All right. Um, who does the offering? What are they called? The ushers. Ushers. Is it offering time? Is that what it is? Okay. Or what are we supposed to do now? Hymns. Okay. It says, okay, come up and do a hymn. You can do whatever you want to do. There you go. Good morning. I had a little something to say about that last song that we sang, that In Christ Alone. If anybody has trouble, like, sharing the gospel with people just by talking, just sing that song in five minutes. It's the entire gospel in that song. And it was just awesome. I, you know, I just really listened to the words. I thought, man, you can sing that song and tell somebody the whole gospel of Christ from his birth to our going to glory. So, pretty awesome. Anyway, go ahead and stand. And our first hymn is Come Ye Thankful People Come.
come forward to get the offering? Father God, uh, we thank you for all the blessings that you give us. Uh, your love endures forever. We thank you and praise you for the opportunity to give back to you. We pray that you would use this offering to continue to glorify you and uh, to let us remember that you sent your son to die on that cross for our sins. And we pray that we would bring more people back to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Charlotte. Can you stand for the doxology, please? Great is thy faithfulness. And the kids can go to children's church.
seated. Thank you. Good job. That was great. All right. Beautiful song. That's Michelle's favorite hymn, Great Is Thy Faithfulness. How many favorite hymn, Great Is Thy Faith? Wow, what a song. I don't know if this is loud out there, but it just seems like it's, maybe turn it down a little bit. No, you're good. <laughs> somebody said, you know, this is a real community church. Somebody said it was too loud and somebody said, turn it up. We're good. So com- this is, this represents, co- how many former Baptists? How many former Presbyterians? How many former Methodists? How many former Catholics, right? That's good. That's why I, I love pastoring community churches uh, because I, I, I like it when everybody can come together because just like jo, uh, Joe said, uh, it's all about Christ alone. It's in Christ alone, right? And uh, that's what we're here today. We're coming as a unified body of Christ to, to celebrate Jesus, our resurrected Savior. Turn to Acts chapter 2. And we've been in a sermon series the last few weeks on just some foundational sermons about the church, some things that the Lord's laid on my heart, Pastor Scott's heart, just, um, you know, what makes a healthy church. And when I say a healthy church, we could say a healthy local church, but but more importantly, a, a global church, big C. And these are foundations um, in Scripture on the church. You know, the the first sermon that I preached, foundation of the church. Uh, The second one was on the fuel for the church. That's prayer. That's prayer. And I'm so glad to see how prayer is a priority at Kersey Community Church and that there's people that come even during the Sunday school hour. Did you know that there are people who come and pray in the conference room? And by the way, if you feel called to pray and that's your ministry to pray, why don't you join in the conference room during the Sunday school hour? Okay, because I'll tell you, we just need to bathe the church in prayer. Last week, um, Pastor Scott preached on the mission of the church. The mission is discipleship. Go make disciples. Today I want to preach uh, a unique message. Normally around we get to the Thanksgiving. I usually preach a Thanksgiving message, but for some reason I just feel um, led to, to preach on the subject of the power for the church. The power for the church. And this started because I, I read a story uh, several years ago at the city of L.A., the city of L.A., they met, they saw that they were one of the most polluted cities in the nation. And they are, for sure. <laughs> Been there. <laughs> and they, so they wanted to address the, the pollution issue. They wanted to address the pollution problem. So the leaders of the city, they hired the best, the brightest environmental professionals to come in to study the pollution issue, to give some guidance based on their expertise on how to get the pollution under control. And I thought this was an interesting story. And so they, they, they came in, they brought in the, the, the best, the brightest minds, the best environmentalists from around the nation to study the pollution. So that they came for the panel to reveal their findings. And they had a press conference, and the leader of the panel, he got up, and he, he gave his summary, and this was his statement. This was his statement, and I quote. Now, let me, pre- let me premise this. Preachers find application with everything. And, I mean, that, that's how it is. When, when you're a preacher, everything is an illustration. And, and that's how I learn. I learn. That's why I love the parables of Jesus. My father's a great preacher, and he told stories and illustrate. It just helps me to learn. So when I tell my stories, it's because it helps me to learn, okay? And so this was his statement, and I want to see if you, can go, if you can catch where I'm going with this. He said this. He said, ladies and gentlemen, and I got this online. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm embarrassed to give this report to you. I realize that you've paid a large sum of money for our findings, But I've always tried to be honest. Therefore, honestly, I submit to you that there is no solution for your pollution problem. And then he paused and he said this, and this is what got me. He said, what you really need is a wind from elsewhere to sweep down through your city and blow the pollution out to sea. And that's the only way I see that will clean your city of the pollution. He said, a fresh 
wind from elsewhere, a wind from elsewhere to blow the pollution away. I was talking to somebody before the service about Florida hurricanes. Around the end of summer, we know that there's a hurricane, hurricanes that are going to come through. So, you just come to expected. People down in Florida, they have hurricane parties. I mean, people are celebrating when hurricane, Michelle loves a hurricane. Go figure. I dread hurricane. I'm scared of hurricanes. And so, but anyways, the, so the hurricanes, they come to where we live. We were usually spared, just some rough winds. But, but it is interesting when you walk outside after a hurricane's blown through and those heavy winds, when you walk outside, there is a freshness in the air. It's just a, a cleansing. It's, ah, it smells better. It's just a refreshing because that wind has blown through and blown out the, that old stench and, and the pollution. A fresh wind, a fresh wind has blown through. The period of time between the Old Testament and the New Testament is called the intertestamental period. It was a, a span of around 400 years between the writing of the last book of the Old Testament and the, the New Testament. Well, actually, the books are not in chronolog chronological order, but let's just say the end of the Old Testament to the, end of the, to the beginning of the New Testament. God during that time appeared to be silent. 400 years. Why was He silent? Well, he was silent because sin had polluted and taken over the souls of men. It was a dark time in history, especially for Israel, for the, Jew, for the Jewish people. Religion was polluted. Worship was polluted. God's people, they were mixing the worship of God with the worship of, of idols. The priests of the temple were polluted. The sacrifices they offered to God were polluted. So, the temple during that time had become polluted. It seemed there was no solution to the pollution of sin that had engulfed planet Earth. But then in the midst of the pollution, Jesus, God in flesh, came from elsewhere. He came from elsewhere. He showed up. And, and you know the story. He gave His life as a sacrifice to cleanse, to cleanse us from sin, to cleanse the pollution of sin, to cleanse the pollution that sin had brought to the world. And 40 days He arose, and 40 days after He arose He ascended back to Heaven. But right before He left He told His disciples, now don't turn, we're going to get to Acts 2. But He told His disciples in Luke 24, 49, He said, I want you to stay here in the city until the Holy Spirit until the Holy Spirit comes and fills you with power from heaven. The Holy, in other words, I want you to stay here until a fresh wind from elsewhere comes in and fills you with power. So, a little over a week later, well, Jesus, He ascended. Over a week later, the Jews were celebrating Pentecost. Pentecost. Pentecost literally just means 50. <laughs> You got the Pentecostal denomination, and you know, sometimes people are, are, are weird, you're weirded out by the crazy Pentecostals. Pentecost means 50, okay? That's all it means, okay? So, Pentecost, it, it's actually a Jewish holiday that is, it, it's a celebration of God giving the law to Moses at Mount Sinai. All right, so 50 days uh, after Passover is when God gave the law. And so, that is when Pentecost is celebrated by Jews all around the world. And they were celebrating Pentecost. By the way, Jesus was, cruci was crucified on Passover. All right, so Acts 2. And we're going to continue with the story here. Acts 2 verse 1 says, When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, a wind. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting. It filled the entire house, the wind, the wind. So, during Pentecost... That wind, remember my, my little application, my little story that got my wheels spinning. That wind from elsewhere began to blow. The, as a, the, the, the wind from elsewhere blew on the 120 in the upper room. In your notes, I basically got two notes and three sub points. Number one, the first thing in your notes, the wind represents the Holy Spirit. The wind represents the Holy Spirit. The Greek word for spirit here is the word pneuma. Pneuma, which means breath, wind. 
Remember in the, in the, in the, when the disciples met Jesus and Jesus, he breathed. He breathed on him and said, receive the Holy Spirit. It's wind. It's Numa. And so when the, the rushing mighty wind of the Holy Spirit blew in, it brought cleansing to the lives of the disciples. It brought boldness. When the wind blew, the same Peter who cursed and denied Jesus 50 days earlier, he became empowered. It's like he is a new man. And he began to preach the Word of God without fear. Thousands were saved. Read, read. I love reading the, the book of Acts and the excitement in the church and the, the way the church grew. When the wind blew, the rest of the disciples... Their lives were changed. They, they, they were empowered. They were emboldened to proclaim Jesus. Timidity and fear was blown away when the wind blew in, when the Holy Spirit came, a fresh devotion to Christ. A renewed passion had arrived when the wind blew, when the wind blew. You know, in, in the church world, and I've been in the church world all my life. My father still pastors full time today. And I grew up, uh, I grew up as, as a, Baptist, a Baptist preacher's kid. So I know, I know the church. I know the church world. And in the, the church world, a lot of times people don't want to talk about the Holy Spirit. They don't want to preach about the Holy Spirit because there's, there's two extreme views about the Holy Spirit in, in the church world. You know, one side, you've, you've got one side that, that they're rigid, like the Calvinistic approach where, where they're, oh, they're they don't, we're not even going to talk about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit doesn't move. You know, we, we, you know th those are the kind of people that are wanting to debate everything. You know, so where do you stand theologically, hermeneutically, eschatologically? Where do you stand? Hmm? And they're always wanting to debate with you. And, and I'm like, I don't know. I love Jesus. I love Jesus. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I mean, I did take apologetics. And, 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 but I mean, that's the side where they don't even want to talk about the Holy Spirit. But then you got the, the, the other extreme side. I think the person who said hallelujah, you might be on this side. <laughs> oh, that was lit. Yeah, you are holy roller. That's right. <laughs> That's right. That was, you got the Pentecostal side. <laughs> amen. That was a Baptist. Baptists say amen. Pentecostal say hallelujah. <laughs> So, and you got this side over here where, where they abuse the role of the Holy Spirit. You know, everything, they don't understand that, that the Holy Spirit draws people to Jesus, convicts them. It's all about Holy Spirit, 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 where it's almost weird and creepy. And you've, and you've seen like the guys, like the televangelists on TV, and they're swinging their, their coat. You ever seen that? And they're swinging their coat around, and they're trying to knock people over in and, and the Holy Ghost, and people's fall. I mean, that is weird to me. That is creepy to, you know, when I, when I, I rededicated my life to God, and, and in South Carolina, I went into this church. It was called a family church. And so I'm thinking, <laughs> I'm thinking it's a family church. This was one of the creepy churches. And so I walked into the church and I mean, I'm just, I'm, I'm young, I'm early twenties and I'm walking in cause I'm just excited for the Lord. And the preacher comes up to me, he walks down and he puts his hand like this and I'm standing and I'm like, dude, you better get off. You better back up right now. I mean, it's like he was, it's like he was trying to push me over. And uh, so that's weird. That's weird stuff. They abuse the role of the Holy Spirit. You know what I've discovered as a, as a pastor when it comes to weird stuff? Look, the Holy Spirit's not weird. The people are the weird ones. <laughs> Do you agree? How we've messed this up. I'm in the middle. I, I, I'm in the, I'm not in either camp. I'm in the Bible camp. I believe that, I believe in your articles, our church articles of faith. As, as a matter of fact, the articles of faith for, uh, for Kersey Community Church says, we believe in the Holy Spirit who came forth from the Father and Son to convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment, and to regenerate, sanctify, and empower all who believe in Jesus Christ. I stand 100% with every single one of your articles of faith. You can get them off the website. I wouldn't be here. 
if I, if I didn't come into alignment with where you are as a church, members voted and, and ratified that. But I'm here to tell you, I can't survive without the Spirit being active in my life. I cannot survive. I can't survive as a Christian. I can't survive as a pastor. I don't trust myself. I don't trust myself. I, I really don't. Because in, as the Apostle Paul said, he says, in my flesh dwells no, nothing good. Oh, wretched man that I am. I need the Holy Spirit operating it as a, as a preacher, as a pastor. John, John 14, verse 16 and 17, Jesus said, I'm going to ask the Father and he'll give you another helper. How many of you need a helper? <laughs> Jesus said, I'm going to give you a helper. I'm going to give you a helper and, and to be with you forever, even the spirit of truth. See, that's what I'm preaching. See, the problem, though, in many churches today is because we were so fearful of being labeled Pentecostal, charismatic, whatever, we, to, so, to where we're so fearful of even being labeled. We don't want anybody to think anything about, we're not that kind of, but what happens is we, we end up so often pushing out the Holy Spirit. We end up pushing, we, we, it's almost like we, because we're fearful of what others might think, it's like we treat the Holy Spirit like He's a second class citizen, like He's unwanted. We're pushing out the spirit of truth. We're pushing out the helper. And we wonder why there's so much sin in the church. We wonder why. I'm not saying this church. I'm saying in, in globe, so much sin in churches, so much strife in churches, so much powerlessness in churches because we've blocked the very person Jesus sent to sanctify us and, and make us holy and, and live a godly life. And see, that, that's what happens so often. We can't do that. We can't do it. Think about the sins that are destroying lives. Even the lives of Christians. Alcoholism. Drug addiction. Go to Loveland just wanting to enjoy the lights and crowd comes by just smoking dope. Man, I didn't even know what marijuana smelled. I've never been around marijuana until I came to Colorado. <laughs> I know what it smells like now. I'm like, ooh, that actually smells pretty good. Well, no, I didn't say that. I didn't say that. I didn't say that. <laughs> but I mean, I think you open up the doors, and, and what about all the drug addiction? What, what, what about the, the, even in churches and Christians and pastors, what about pornography? I mean, these are sins. These, these, are, they, 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 these violate the, the, the Word of God, strongholds, people that are bound, bitterness, and, and, and that you can't move past the hurts of, of the past. What I'm saying, here's, here's all I'm saying. This is simple today. We need a fresh wind from elsewhere to blow through our churches. We need the Holy Spirit in our lives. We need the Holy Spirit to clean up our lives. And I'm burdened about this because I don't know about you, but, but I, I just believe we're living in the last days. And I believe these are dark and troubled times. I, listen, I don't have time to play church politics. I don't have time to play religion. I, I've been called and commissioned to rescue the perishing and, and care for the dying. I need the Holy Spirit to operate in my life. And we need it in our, in our churches. Here's, here's, a, here's a major point about when the wind blew. Notice it blew on Pentecost. When they, when God gave the law, it blew when they were celebrating the giving of the law. Now I want you to think about this, because even the Apostle Paul, the, he, he says the law was good. The law is holy. The law is a good thing. But see, the problem is the religious leaders and the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they perverted the law. Of course, we as New Testament believers, we know that we're not saved by works of the law, we're saved by grace alone. But what happened in this day is the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they perverted the law. They started adding new laws and new rules over what God gave, the tablets that God gave. 613 laws they added to following God. So think about this. They took a holy thing and they turned it into a dead, meaningless religion. Deadness, dryness, no personal relationship with God, just rules. Just rules. And for hundreds of years, going to the temple, it was just, it was just a ritual. Going to church, just, just a ritual. Same thing, different day. Dad, why are we going to the temple? Because we're supposed to. Dad, why do we do it this way? 
that's the way we've always done it. You know, I love, if you've seen the movie Fiddler on the Roof, I love that musical. I love the music of it. Tevye, I love the beginning. Tradition, 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 tradition. And, 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 and I think, I don't want to butcher, but it's like, so you ask, why we do it like this? Why do we have all of these rules and regulations? I don't know. <laughs> I love that part. That's, that's, see, that's what happened. Is, is hundreds of years. It's just deadness. But when the wind blew, when the Holy Spirit came, those boring rituals and, and religion, they, they blew it out, brought in a, a fresh new relationship with God. And see, I don't think that we need more religion. I don't think we need more regulation. We don't need more rituals. We need a move of the Holy Spirit. We need revival in our land. Do you believe we need revival? Revival in our land. We need revival in our nation. You know, revival is not for the lost. Revival is for the church. Revival is when saved people get on fire for the Lord. And that's what we need. So the wind represents the Holy Spirit. Here's my second point. Wind has power. Wind has power. Wind has power to generate electricity. Wind has power to sail a ship. Wind even has power to destroy a city. So here the wind speaks of the power of God. And we see that through a, a, a constant thread in the Bible. Wind represents the power of the Holy Spirit, the power of God. You know, there's an interesting story, Ezekiel 37, if you want to turn there, about the power of the wind, the power of the Holy Spirit. What, what happens is the Lord brought Ezekiel to a valley of dry, dead, decaying, scattered bones. And the Lord asked Ezekiel, hey, do, do you think these bones can live? And Ezekiel's like, I don't know. Only you know. Only you know, God. And so the Lord, he, he tells Ezekiel, he says, I want you to prophesy. I want you to speak to these bones. See, see what, what God is about to do. God is about to give Ezekiel a prophetic picture of Israel coming back to life, returning back to the land out of captivity. So that's what this all represents. And so Ezekiel begins prophesying to the bones, and he speaks what God said. He speaks the word of the Lord. The bones start reattaching themselves together. Imagine the scene in the boneyard. The bones, they come back together, and skin starts to form on the skeleton, and hair starts to cut. Yeah, I mean, just, just an amazing, amazing scene. And so, there were once all dead, scattered bones, but now there's perfectly formed bodies lying around that valley. And then God next, he tells Ezekiel in 37 verse 9, he says, I want you to prophesy to the breath, to the breath, breath. That word breath here is the Hebrew word ruach, ruach, which it's the same word as the Greek word pneuma, which means breath, which means wind. So verse 9 continues, God says, prophesy, son of man, say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, breathe on these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. I love that scripture. It says they stood on their feet. They stood on their feet. I, I, I love that because that's what happens when the Spirit moves. That's what happens when, 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 when God breathes His Spirit on you. Stand up on your feet. You know, maybe there's somebody here today or somebody that's listening, watching online, and you're, you feel like you're down for the count. You feel like you're just lying straight on your back. Your world is completely destroyed. The pieces are scattered all over the place. But I'll tell you what will put you back on your feet is the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God will, will put you on your feet. That's the answer. The answer. <laughs> the answer, my friend, is blow it in the wind. All you boomers and Peter, Paul, and Mary, right? It is. The, the, the answer, the answer. You know, I've taken counseling classes. I've, I've taken psychology, psychology, and there's only so much that my counsel will offer. But it's the Holy Spirit that will really do a work in your life and, and raise you up on your feet and put your life back together. It also says, verse 10, not only did they stand up when the wind blew, but it says they became an exceedingly great army, a powerful army. 
That's what happens. When the Spirit moves, that's what happens with, with the Spirit's power. It not only causes you to stand on your feet and, and puts you back together, but, but, but you, you rise up and you become an exceedingly great, powerful army. Why are there so many weak Christians? Because the wind hasn't blown on them, because the Spirit's power is lacking in their lives. Why are so many Christians despondent and ready to give up? Because they don't have the Spirit's power in their life. Why aren't Christians living out the mission of the church like Pastor Scott preached last week of making disciples? Because the wind of the Spirit that hasn't empowered them, hasn't, hasn't filled them up. You know, I still believe Acts 1.8 which says, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And then he says, once you get the power from the Holy Spirit, he says, and then you'll make disciples. Then you'll be my witness. You know, it's amazing what the Spirit of God can do in the life of the believer. He can turn your life around from dry, dead, scattered bones to being put back together and standing on your feet as a mighty, powerful army of disciples for the Lord. And my question as I close is, do you need some refreshing? Is your Christian life a little stale? You need some freshness? You know, Pastor Scott does a great message at teaching classes, and, and this message last week was so wonderful about making disciples and sharing Jesus. But I'll tell you, the, 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 the secret sauce to the discipleship is accompanying the Word of God with the Spirit of God. And allow the Spirit to move through you. Here's three words. I'm going to leave with you. Three words. And this is my little protocol every day. This is my protocol. And I put this together on what I do every day. When I wake up to help me be a better man, a better husband, a better Christian, a, a better pastor, a better leader. Three words. Stay, pray, say. Stay, pray, say. There's, there's my three words. What does stay mean? Well, Luke 24, 49 says, but stay here in the city until the Holy Spirit comes and fills you with power from heaven. What's the application for us? What does that mean for us? It means get in the position. Stay. Get into the position for the Spirit to move in your life, for the wind to blow. What's the position for the believer? It's the position of surrendering your life to Jesus. It's submitting your life to Jesus. It's obedience. It's confession of sin. It's repenting for the things in your life that hinders the wind. That's the, that's the stay part. God, God, forgive me for my faults and my failures. God, forgive me for the things that I say and the things I don't do and the things I sh God, forgive me, have mercy. God, God, I submit my life to you. God, I surrender my life to you. God, forgive me for trying to cling to my own life. God, I, I give you my life. That's the stay part. And I do that, I do that every morning. I, I, God, this day belongs to you. God, I surrender myself to you. One preacher said to be filled with the Holy Spirit is to be filled with the spirit of submission. Of submission. I want you to see this is not a weird thing. I know that the crazies make being filled with the Holy Spirit about, about an experience. Look, this has nothing to do with an experience. It's about submitting yourself to the Lord. It's an action. It's an action. It means we're no longer living for ourselves. We're giving God complete control of our lives. The more we yield to the Lord, the more the Spirit fills us. Romans 12, 1 and 2. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God with your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, good, acceptable acceptable and perfect. It's giving yourself as a sacrifice. Number two, pray. What does that mean? Well, I've submitted my life to the Lord. I've surrendered my life to Him. I've confessed, God, I have mercy. I repent. Then ask Him, God, fill me today with Your Spirit. 
You know, the Apostle Paul, he wrote in Ephesians 5, 18, he says, don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. The Apostle Paul wrote that. That word be filled is actually in the ever present tense in the, in the, the Greek language. So, actually what Paul is saying is be continually filled with the Holy Spirit. That means every day, God, I need you to fill me. Fill me up with you. Fill me up with more of you, more of you, more of you, more of you. Pray. Luke eleven thirteen. 13, Jesus said, so if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? So ask. Ask. I, I'm telling you, you start doing this, you're going to see amazing changes in your world. God, oh, I'll fill me up today. Fill me up. And then see, I just threw this in. This is say. <laughs> Stay, pray, and say. You know what this is about? This is just about me thanking God for what He's done, thanking God for what He's going to do in my life. It's about thanking Him in advance. See, I believe when I pray, I believe the Lord answers my prayers when I pray according to the Word of God. You know, if, if Philippians 4, 6 says, pray about everything. Tell God what you need. Thank Him for all He's done. So, so the saying is the thanking Thank you, God, for how you're going to use me to touch somebody today. Thank you, God, for filling me up with joy. Thank you for, for renewed. I'm thanking. So I stay, pray, say. I just want to encourage you to start getting in the habit of that little protocol right there. Stay, pray, say. This is my daily protocol. We need this in our lives. I want to ask you to bow your heads. And while your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, and I always just like to have just a, a time at the end of every message, just for time you and between you and God. This is between you and God, a time of reflection. We don't need to hurry and rush out. Let's respond to what the Lord is saying. Maybe there's somebody in here today. There's somebody watching online, and you don't even have a relationship with the Lord. This is all foreign to you. And your life, maybe your life is a mess. Or maybe you feel like you're not good enough to come to church. Maybe that's why you're watching online. You're not, God will never forgive me for what I've done. I'm here to tell you where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. You know, the only thing we bring to the salvation process, the only thing we bring is our sins, our faults, and our failures. We bring nothing, we bring nothing to the process. But today you can receive Jesus. Can I lead you in a prayer to receive Jesus as Savior? This is the most important prayer you'll ever pray from your heart, from your heart. Pray with me. Pray, Jesus, I know you went to the cross for me. Jesus, I know you shed your blood for me. I know that I cannot save myself. I know my sins are great. I'm putting all my trust in you. All my trust in you in Christ alone. In Christ alone, my hope is found. And I ask the Lord to forgive you of sin. Ask the Lord to, to come into your life, to come into your life. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. A simple prayer of faith will usher you into the family of God. I want to encourage you to come and see me, come and see a deacon, come and see uh, Pastor Scott so we can help you in your walk with Christ, so we can start discipling you. Welcome to the family of God. And right before we sing another song, Christian, maybe you're here today and maybe you need refreshing. Maybe you need renewed passion, renewed zeal for the Lord. Maybe your life is stale, your, your circumstances, whatever. I don't, I don't know what's going on, but I just want to pray for you that the Holy Spirit would touch you and empower you today. And I know this might be new for some people, but I'm here to tell you, Jesus, He gave you the helper. If you're a believer, you've got the Holy Spirit of God living inside you, and He will fill you and He will empower you today. For those that, uh, just while nobody's looking around, and they're, they're even zoomed in on me online, for those who need some refreshing, who need some refreshing and want me to pray for you. Would you just slip up your hand? This is a sign of surrender. I need refreshing. 
I want to pray for you. I want to pray for you. Father, I just pray in Jesus' name. God, I just pray, Lord, every single hand that's lifted, Lord, I just pray that you would touch that individual, that you would touch their life, Father, in Jesus' name. God, I pray that, that the, the Spirit would come alive within them, and, and Lord, that, that the fire, the passion for, for Jesus would be renewed in their life. God, embolden them and empower them to be disciples. Father, I pray that you would fill them with joy and, and fill them with hope, Father, and fill them with purpose in their life. God, we know that you're going to use them in mighty, mighty ways. You know every single situation in their life. And God, I'm asking you to intervene in their life and intervene in their family, Father, and bring refreshing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet. The worship team, go ahead and come on up. Go ahead and lead us final song.
All right, let's uh, pray and we'll close the service here today. Father God, uh, thank you for this message today. Thank you for the Holy Spirit. Thank you for the opportunity to come together and worship you again today. Be with us all as we go from here. In Jesus' name, amen.